Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first Kundal Center uh, speaker series of the new academic year. Before we get started, I'd like to first of all do a land acknowledgement. CAMH is situated on lands that have been occupied by First Nations for millennia. Lands rich in civilizations with knowledge of medicine, architecture, technology, and extensive trade routes throughout the Americas. The site of CAMH appears in colonial records as the council grounds of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Toronto is now home to a vast diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples who enrich this city. CAMH is committed to reconciliation. We will honor the land through programs and places that reflect and respect its heritage. We will embrace the healing traditions of our ancestors of the ancestors and weave them into our caring practices. We will create new relationships and partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, share the land and protect it for future generations. Just a couple of reminders before we get going. Please keep your audio muted during the presentation, but we encourage you to keep your video on. During the question and discussion time, press the raise hand button in the reactions tab to be unmuted, or you can write your question or comment in the chat box. We will be sharing slides and a recording of this presentation after the event with all registrants. And please, please email Samantha Brownell at camh.ca if you experience any technical difficulties. Your feedback is very valuable to us and essential uh, for providing you with the information you need. Please take the time to complete the evaluation form that's shared in the chat box at the end of the presentation. We'll also email all the registrants the link in case you sign off early today. Our presenters today are Renira Renandez and Matt Prebig. Their talk is entitled Tools You'll Use, a guided tour of resources developed to support an integrated care pathway for youth with depression. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Kundal Center, it is a research and knowledge translation center devoted to improving best practices with respect to child and youth depression. We're engaged in trying to find out the best way to prevent depression, to enhance our early intervention services, and to uh, have better treatment resources and prevention of relapse. We have a number of different projects on the go and knowledge translation that is sharing our knowledge with everybody who um, encounters children and youth with depression is a really important part of our mandate. And Rhaenyra is a really is the leader really of our knowledge translation activities. We've done some really exciting things under Rhaenyra's leadership and I'm excited uh, that she will be able to share much of this with you today. So I'll hand it off to Rhaenyra and to Matt, off you go. Thank you so much, um, Peter, for your introduction. I'm just gonna share my slides here. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Rhaenyra, if you don't already know me, and I have with me today, Matt. Matt, uh, do you wanna say a quick hi? Yeah, hi, everybody. It's so great to be here to chat with you today. So Matt and I are really excited to be here, and we're not just saying that, we actually talked about it and we concurred that we were in fact very excited about today, so we're so happy that you could join us. Um, as you might guess from the title, today we're going to be giving you a tour of some of the tools that we've developed to support an integrated care pathway for youth with depression. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that this work um, is based on all of the work at the Kundal Center, and there's a lot of people involved in um, the work that we do. And this isn't even the entire Kundal Center. This picture was taken probably a few years ago now, and since then, um, we've had more members join. Our uh, associate director, Dr. Stephanie Amis, is now with us. Um, Matt, I'm kind of outraged that you're not in this picture, but Matt is a big part of our youth engagement. Um, uh, work as well. A lot of the tools that I'll be sharing with you today have been developed from um, Dr. Darren Courtney's Caribou Integrated Care Pathway Project. Um, if you don't know Dr. Darren Courtney, I don't know if you can see me circling um, on the picture here, but um, that is Dr. D Darren Courtney. Oops. 
So today, um, so these are not just learning objectives that I put together because I had to. These are things that I actually hope will happen. Okay. I know a lot of you may already be familiar with knowledge translation, um, but if you're not, I hope that by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to understand it enough to explain it to someone else. I also hope that you'll identify at least two of our tools that you think are really great and be able to describe them and hopefully even use them. And finally, and this is where Matt is really going to help me, we want you to understand what youth engagement is and um, why it's important to the work that we do. So I know a lot of you are here today to see these tools that we've developed, and I promise they're coming in just about 10 minutes, okay? But first, I want you to imagine that it's the year 2004, and I want to ask you, what were you doing in that year? Feel free, if you're comfortable, to type it in the chat. Um, think about whether it's your professional life, your personal life. Um, what were you doing in 2004? I can start. In 2004, I was a teenager. I was in school. If you need some reminders, here are some world events from the year 2004. Facebook was founded by Mark Zuckerberg in 2004. Of course, we didn't start using it until 2006. And in 2021, very few people use it. Uh, Martha Stewart was arrested. We got some pictures of Mars. Here are some world leaders in 2004. Kind of sad that Canada is not considered a world leader, but in case anyone is interested, I think our prime minister was Paul Martin. If I'm incorrect, someone please correct me in the chat. So what is the significance of the year 2004, why is it important? Well, it actually isn't, except for the fact that 2004 was 17 years ago. And it has been found that it takes 17 years for research findings to be implemented in practice. Now just think about how long that is and how much has happened in the last 17 years. Social media in 2004 was in its infancy and now it's become somewhat of a necessity, harmful as that may be to young people as we've seen in the past few weeks. Uh, we just shot William Shatner up into space and space tours is becoming a thing. The whole world has changed since 2004, except I might point out perhaps Russia. 17 years is a long time to take the things we learn and apply it to clinical practice or policy. Now, is it always 17 years? Of course not. 17 years is an estimate across different types of health research. And there's literature out there that looks into how to quantify these time legs and considers um, you know, the complexities involved and how it might impact practice and policy. Understanding this is, you know, might be important to someone whose job it is to look at a broader system level policy and to think about how we can speed up the translation process across the board. That is not my job. My job at the Kundal Center is really just to get things done and to try to take the knowledge that we're generating from our Kundal Center projects and see if and how we can make it more usable. This is knowledge translation, and I'm sure a lot of you in the audience today are already familiar with the concept. In case you're not, here is an actual definition from CIHR. I personally find this definition a bit counterintuitive to the concept of knowledge translation, which is really just to make things easy to understand right away at the get-go. I personally do not think this definition does that. I like to think of knowledge translation as simply bridging that gap between research and practice or moving knowledge into action. And in fact, this is how a lot of people do describe knowledge translation. I actually have my own definition of knowledge translation that um, I've, I've written a spoken word poem about it. If you're interested, you can look it up on YouTube. I think for me, as a knowledge broker on the ground, a more important question than how long is it taking is what is an acceptable amount of time and are we there yet? I would argue, how are we doing? I would argue without having any specific number in mind that it is still taking too long and that some of that research probably never makes its way across the valley and onto the other side of the cliff. I mean, just think about all the research that is generated, all the publications that get pushed out. Um, and just now I, I started thinking about all the tools that I promise I will be showing you very shortly. These tools didn't have to exist. These tools were developed because we at the Kundal Center have a very specific and intentional knowledge translation mandate. So back to this gap. Um, what are some reasons why this gap exists? Why does it take so long, however long that may be? And why does it perhaps not happen at all? Well, some of the reasons for this could be a lack of awareness, right? Clinicians are busy. They don't always have time to keep up to date on all the latest research. 
Another problem could be lack of comprehension. Maybe they're interested in the research, but it's just not easy to understand, not easy to digest right away. Maybe work hasn't been put into the knowledge translation or the knowledge synthesis process. And another problem could be lack of relevance. Maybe research is generating, is being generated that is actually not relevant to the people who are meant to use it. So at the Kundal Center, we have a knowledge translation framework that addresses these things, this problem of lack of relevance, lack of comprehension, lack of awareness. I promise we will be getting to these tools, but first I do wanna talk a little bit about our framework so you can understand how all of these things work together. When we develop our tools, we develop them in such a way that we try to make the knowledge we generate very easy to understand and very easy to use. And so this is how we try to address that lack of comprehension problem. Partnerships are also extremely important uh, to our center. On the top there, you'll see an example. This is uh, the Georgian Bay Family Health Team who we've partnered with and we're working with right now. On the bottom there are some of our youth engagement facilitators. Matt is here today to tell you a bit more about how we work with young people and why that's important. Um, our partnerships really help address that lack of relevance problem because we believe that if you engage the people that your work is meant to be for um, at the beginning, and sometimes it's not always at the beginning, sometimes you might engage them in the middle or at the end, there's different levels of engagement, which Matt will tell you about. But if you make that effort to engage people in your work, in the knowledge that you're generating, it's more likely to be relevant and more likely to be used. Next, we have our activities. So what we're doing right now is an activity. This um, speaker series is one way that we try to address this lack of awareness problem where we share our knowledge with you. Um, and today we're sharing our tools with you. I also quickly wanna tell you about this Georgian Bay project because I will be referring to it again shortly. Um, we've been working with this Georgian Bay Family Health Team as well as the Community Mental Health Center, New Path uh, Youth and Family Services to implement an integrated care pathway in their setting. So that is one of our implementations initiatives. Finally, um, communication channels are important and these also help address that lack of awareness piece. Um, we know that it's not enough just to develop products that are easy to understand and easy to use, but we also need to communicate about them. And so we try to find the channels that will best reach our audiences. Um, the example there on the, on the top right is just an Instagram post of one of our tools, um, our Mood Matters video that we posted on Instagram. So I just wanted to, um, before we get into the tools, give you an, an overview of how knowledge translation works and how we consider all of these things in our knowledge translation work. So now that um, I've showed you how knowledge translation works now, I wanna talk a bit about the journey of how we got to the point where we are today um, with all these tools that we've developed for the integrated care pathway. Um, one of the first studies to come out of our center looked at all the services um, for young people with depression across Ontario, and the bottom line of the study is that the services are variable and that many are not evidence-based. We were also um, uh, at the beginning very interested in clinical practice guidelines. If you're not familiar with clinical practice guidelines, they're um, basically recommendations that help inform decisions around prevention, assessment, and treatment. Um, if they're done well, they're evidence-based or evidence-informed. They include input from stakeholders and they allow um, room for clinical judgment as well. So our team at the Kundal Center, Darren Courtney, Kathy Bennett, Peter Samari et al. did a systematic review and quality appraisal and found that of all the clinical practice guidelines out there for young people with depression, the best one is the NICE guidelines. So my question as a knowledge broker is always, so what? So we have this information. Um, can we do anything with it? What do we do with it? Well, the bottom line of this study is that, well, we really should be using services that are um, informed by evidence, and we should try to decrease the variability in services. The bottom line of this review is that we should probably be using the NICE guidelines. They're evidence informed, they factor in clinical judgment, and they allow for stakeholder input. So how do we go from this to the next step? Here we have a problem. Services are not evidence-based, they're all over the place. And here we have a potential solution. Well, these NICE guidelines are evidence informed. How do we start using them? Well, what we did was we read the NICE guidelines. This is the short version, uh, 45 pages. The longer version is closer to 200 pages. And we developed what we call the Kundal at CAMH Decision Aid for the Treatment of Depression in Youth. So this decision aid, um, goes through all the steps in the, from the NICE guidelines. It takes providers through assessment, through psychoeducation, um, psychotherapy, medication, team review. Um, 
it uh, isn't, it has been decontextualized a bit from the NICE guidelines. So the NICE guidelines are based in the UK. We've kind of removed that UK context and uh, made it more relevant to the Canadian context. But the decision aid alone um, does leave room for interpretation. Uh, it doesn't define which assessment scales should be used exactly. It recommends that there should be cutoffs when thinking about um, how you might use that assessment scale to define whether a young person was responding or whether they've gone into remission. Those things aren't defined in this decision aid. That um, kind of that is contextualized more in these integrated care pathways. So I don't want you to get bogged down by um, all the information that's on these slides. In fact, um, I'm just going to blur them because you, you don't really need to know um, all the details of these pathways. I just want you to know that from this Cumberlat CAMH decision aid, two integrated care pathways have been developed. On the left, we have uh, Dr. Darren Fortney's Caribou One project at CAMH. Uh, and on the right, we have the project that we've been working on with the Georgian Bay Family Health Team um, and their integrated care pathway. These pathways um, are contextualized for, for specific settings. They do include the measurement tools that should be used. They do provide cutoff indicators for things like response and remission. So to our tools, um, just a note that all of the tools I'm going to be showing you are free and they're available on our website. You can access them in three ways. You can go to our website and um, Sam, if you're there, if you could um, drop the uh, complete URL, URL in the chat box, I think that might be helpful. Um, you can always email us whether it's about the tools or not, um, and you can scan the QR code at the top there and that'll bring up the tool page on your phone. So the Cundalat CAMH decision aid I've already told you about. The next tool I want to talk about is the um, manual for the Caribou Integrated Care Pathway. This manual is about, I would say, 30 pages, and it outlines all seven steps of the Integrated Care Pathway. Uh, it includes for each step who is involved, what kind of resources are needed to implement. Um, it has an appendix with a checklist. Uh, definitely uh, check this out if you're interested in implementing uh, an Integrated Care Pathway. Next, um, on the very right of your screen, you'll see a video that Matt actually developed for us. And uh, this video describes the Caribou Integrated Care Pathway to young people. Matt, uh, while you're here, I want to ask you a question. Um, why was it important that we develop this video? Yeah, that's a good question, Renira. And you know what, I think I really liked what you said earlier about how if we want to, if we want the video to be used, we have to make the video or the, just the video, the information relevant to the audience that we're making it for. So, you know, I look at that flowchart and I'm terrified. That's a scary flowchart. And I think that it's really important that if we want the information to be relevant to young people, then we need to work on kind of breaking that barrier and, uh, and making the information a little easier to understand. And a video like that with some fun animations and whatnot is, is probably the best way to do that. Thanks, Matt. Um, it really is an excellent video. So if you get a chance, uh, check it out on our on our website. So um, I think I skipped a step. So both integrated care pathways that I showed you have these core concepts. They, they both include assessment, psychoeducation or lifestyle advice, psychotherapy options, medication options, and team review. Uh, I should actually mention that um, it should be assessment slash measurement because both of the care pathways include measurement based care. Uh, if you're not familiar with that concept, it's essentially it just means um, monitoring young people's symptoms using standardized assessment tools at specific points during the pathway and then um, using that information to inform treatment decisions. So both of the pathways include measurement based care as well. So this is, these are the core components, and these are all the tools that we've developed to support the integrated care pathway. I am going to go through each one of them, um, not in too much detail. Uh, we don't have time for that, but I will talk about each one of them. Um, I'll also talk about a couple of our peripheral tools that weren't necessarily developed for the integrated care pathway, but um, might be of interest to you. The first tool I, I, I want to talk about under screening assessment and measurement is one that we developed um, for primary care providers. It's a simulation video. And in this video, you'll see a young person having an appointment with their primary care provider. And the primary care provider is trying to assess for uh, depression. Uh, we actually didn't think that we were going to make this tool. We thought that we could just find a tool online um, and use that instead. But what we found was that we couldn't find a video that met all of our needs. 
specifically, uh, we showed this, uh, the initial video that we found online to young people, uh, about 20 of them, and they unanimously said that we couldn't use it. <laughs> Matt is giving the thumbs down. Uh, Matt saw the original video as well and uh, did not like it. And I think, Matt, you can jump in at any point um, and, and add anything I might miss, but um, I believe some of the main reasons why they didn't like the video was that um, the provider was very robotic. She was her, The way she was asking the questions was too structured and she didn't really follow up on some of the important things that the young person was saying. And on top of that, her demeanor wasn't the best. She, she appeared a bit um, you know, too clinical, too robotic and young people just couldn't connect with that. Is, is that accurate, Matt? Yeah, I would say so, Ramira. And just making sure that the video is realistic is really important. When the video is not realistic, then you're not really going to gain any real life value from it. So by having something that's a bit more true to life, then uh, hopefully clinicians would find that a bit more helpful. Thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, our, our video not only outlines uh, specific assessment questions and questions around self-harm, we also include concepts that were important, important to young people and not necessarily covered elsewhere. So for example, we include um, consent as an ongoing process and not just something that happens very quickly at the beginning of the appointment. So uh, definitely um, check this out on our, on our website if you're interested. I'll just very uh, quickly talk about this. This is a, one of the peripheral tools I was taught, telling you about. Um, it's a standard set of outcome measures that this organization called the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement has developed. So there are members of the Kundal Center who are involved with ITOM, which is why I'm showing this to you today. Um, they've developed a set of measures that uh, they found have matter most to young people. And they've also come to a consensus um, that these tools are, are valid. And, and should be used. So uh, feel free to check that out. You can go to their, their website or you can check our website out as well. We link to them. This is another kind of a side tool that I wanted to tell you about. It's the Children's Health and Wellbeing Measure developed by um, partners of the Kundal Center at Laurentian University and an Indigenous Health Center. Um, this measure provides Indigenous communities and organizations with an overview of how young people in their communities are doing um, health and wellbeing wise. So it's a tablet, it's an app, and I believe uh, you can access it by going to their website, achwm.ca. Uh, we also link to them on our website. I want to, um, I realize I'm uh, taking longer than I thought, so I'm not going to give as much detail on some of these tools as I had hoped. Um, next, I do want to tell you about some assessment videos that we developed. So in the Georgian Bay Integrated Care Pathway, um, it was decided that the measurement tool that was going to be used for their pathway was the Revised Children's Anxiety and Depression Scale. A um, few of the reasons why that scale was chosen was because it measures both anxiety and depression, which is what the team wanted, and also it is recommended by iCHOM. It's valid and it's reliable. So in implementing that pathway, we realized we probably need to do some training because not everyone may be familiar with the RCAT. So we developed these videos. Um, gonna skip over my next point. And um, I wanna take you with me into a meeting that I had with Matt and with another youth engagement facilitator, Jackie. So um, at this point, we had developed scripts for both these videos. We had developed a storyboard, but we hadn't yet talked to young people about any suggestions they may have um, as it relates to certain words we were using or how things look. So I wanna take you with me back in time to this meeting, um, Matt. Are you ready to go with the script? Oh yeah, now, now we get to reminisce and all the fun that we had. So <laughs> let's take a look here. So I think I remember what I was saying with this slide here. I think I was imagining myself sitting in that seat and thinking, oh yes, I always, that thought always comes to my mind. Hmm, I'm having emotional and behavioral concerns. Those exact words. I'm, 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 I think you're, you're being sarcastic, right? So you yes. obviously don't think I'm having emotional and behavioral concerns. What, what might you be thinking instead? Well, I think we got to make it something a bit more natural. Like what would a young person be saying there? Maybe something along the lines of, you know, hmm, I've been struggling a little bit lately, or I've had a low mood lately, something like that. Okay, I, I, I'm going to make a note of that. Um, we can definitely replace that. Is there anything visually that might be a bit off over here? Visually, I think the lab coat on our clinician here is a little scary. Um, you know, maybe they'd be wearing a lab coat, maybe they wouldn't, but let's, if we have the opportunity, maybe we could make, make them look a little more human. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Lab coat gone. On to the next slide. 
All righty. So this one, I remember the script was what caught my attention first. So we're looking at, we have some really great points in there when we include some different kinds of factors that the patient should consider. Suicide, self-harm, trauma, function, but they're not on the slide. You know, maybe, maybe instead of saying consider other factors, we can actually tell people some factors that they should consider. That's a good point. I think, um, you know, if we want them to consider the factors, it would be good to um, reinforce them visually as well. I, I get where you're going with that. Yeah. And what about what, what is function anyway? Because function is just kind of like, like, am I like a, just clicking the reset button? Am I robot mental health? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you're some kind of a function on a quadratic equation or something like that. Um, what, what might we use instead of function? What about like changes in daily life or something along those lines? Impact on daily life? Ah, I like that. Okay, done. We're changing that ASAP. Um, okay, how about this? All right. I am just going to say it. I don't really get what the whole vibe is with this person. Are they cold? Are they like constipated? I don't, I don't really know what they're feeling right now. <laughs> Um, you know what? I too am wondering the same thing now that I look at this guy. Uh, what, what should we do to him? How should we change him? Let's maybe soften up the facial expression, maybe lose the hug in the arms. And we, if, if, if they're cold, then we could turn the, the heat up a little bit. But maybe the, maybe the expression can change a little more realistic. Got it. I'm, I'm totally on board with that change. Uh, anything in the script? Yeah. Okay. Little detail. Little detail. Some young people won't provide a full account unless they're asked specific questions. I don't know, maybe this is just me, but I think that kind of sounds a little patronizing. Maybe because, you know, I don't know if, if they won't provide an account. Maybe it's just something that uh, we can soften up a bit about like some young people maybe won't feel comfortable providing a full account or something like that. I, I like that. And, and now that I'm reading it again, I, I don't know why we didn't pick it up earlier. That's such a good point. Ooh, okay. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is on the mood and feelings questionnaire, this is like the change over time, right? Like it goes up and then it goes down in their scores? Yeah, correct, change over time. Okay, I don't know if my mood has ever fluctuated that perfectly before in the beautiful arch like that. I'm wondering if maybe we could make the graph look a little more realistic with some zigzags, some jumping around. Uh, that's a very good point, and we can definitely do that. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. Anything in the script you don't like? Hmm. You know what, Rainier, I remember something came to mind earlier, but it's slipping my mind right now. Uh, it might have been around the word improving. Ah, yes, it was improving. Again, makes us sound like we're, we're some robot that we clicked the button and now things are escalating towards improvement. I'm wondering if maybe we could, we could change that a little bit, make you sound a little bit more like humans. <laughs> uh, we can do that. What, what, what we, might we put instead? Maybe like feeling better? Yeah, I think feeling better really resonates with me. Got it. Okay. And I'll keep in mind to try to not use that word improving. It across the board, across any of our tools. I think that's, yeah, that's, a a tough, that's a tough one to avoid. Okay, this one got me. Uh, what, what, what's, what's a T-score? <laughs> well, Matt, keep in mind that this video isn't for young people. It's actually for service providers. And I, young people don't need to know what a T-score is. I think I speak from a lot of, on, on behalf of a lot of service providers when I say, what the heck is a T-score? Yeah. What is it? <laughs> like it just it just sounds so fancy on the video like oh look at me I'm a little t-score oh I too am a t-score only seven people in the whole world know what I am <laughs> do we even know what we are how dare you question us we are the t-scores okay <laughs> enough horsing around Matt okay what are we going to change this to I agree um t-score makes no sense in fact we don't even talk about t-scores until video two so there's no reason for it to be here what should we change it to yeah maybe we just say results that kind of gets to the point perfect done okay 
Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to take this back to the design team and I will send you the next draft. How does that sound? That sounds beautiful. Thanks for bringing me along, Manira. <laughs> Thank you and uh, thank you everyone for joining us in our meeting. I now wanna skip to and, and show you some of the before and afters. This is kind of like one of those fun games, you know, you see in those magazines where you try to pick out everything that's different. There are actually a couple of other things that Matt and I didn't talk about. So if you think you can find them, type it in the chat um, and, and let me know if you can see. But here uh, we took the, the lab coat out right away. We changed emotional and behavioral concerns to I'm feeling pretty low recently. And here uh, we took Matt's advice and we reinforced the, the factors that we want people to actually consider. I think it's quite obvious <laughs> what we did to our friend here. He uh, definitely looks like he's feeling a lot better. Um, and here uh, we did in fact change the graph so it's more realistic uh, for a young person's journey. And finally, uh, sorry, T-score, uh, you're gone and uh, we changed it to result. Um, so I just wanted to show you that quickly. I do encourage you to watch the videos. They are very good. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it to you, Matt, to tell us more about youth engagement. Yes, thank you, Rhaenyra. And yes, we do get to have that much fun whenever we meet to have, uh, to have, these, to have the review sessions like that. Lots of British accents are always a good time. But I just wanna take a sec to talk about what exactly is youth engagement. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot of definitions for it, but I kind of like to break it down into some sort of meaningful collaboration with young people on decisions that are going to affect them. Right. And that can be a lot of different decisions. That could be research, clinical programming, education, policy. It could be a ton of different things. Um, and I think that it's all important to kind of consider, consider them all, but they all kind of fall under this umbrella of youth engagement. So let's talk a little bit about that. Now, here are some ways that our team has sort of developed to make youth engagement more meaningful and effective. And we won't go into too much detail on these, but I just kind of want to highlight some of the important ones here. Now, of course, valuing lived experience and expertise is incredibly important. This essentially means recognizing that youth whose experience comes from living through it rather than studying it in the textbook are still experts in their own right. And from here, many of the other principles kind of naturally follow, like ensuring youth have opportunities for leadership and decision making, having an authentic relationship with them, assuring equity and shared power. Now, when engaging young people, I think it's really important to remember that they're probably busy, uh, maybe with school or work or family or social things, a ton of different stuff. And they're all coming to the table with different experiences, right? So you want to meet, meet them where they're at and be flexible when we're planning our program activities. And having reciprocal activity in mind is probably one of my favorite ones. I think that's a really important aspect of any authentic relationship, right? Uh, it involves knowing that young people benefit from the experiences in the sense that they may be gaining research experience or professional experience. They may be learning about new topics. They may be meeting new people. But in the same breath, researchers and clinicians benefit too, right? in maybe broadening their perspectives, in gaining valuable insights, learning engagement skills. So it's, you really see that mentor and mentee kind of relationship going both ways, which I think is important to keep in mind. And finally, when we're talking about engagement in mental health and substance use, I think safety is a really number one priority. Um, so sensitive topics can come up naturally, and that can be a little triggering. So we wanna make sure that young people are in a safe space right and they want we want to make sure that they're connected to supports in the instance that they may need them now if you're interested in more of the nuanced details uh, we do have like a do's and don'ts infographic that is a bit more detailed so if you're interested in taking a look at that feel free to send us an email and you know we will get you connected with that but uh, otherwise these are some good guiding principles to sort of keep in mind now, part of creating that safe space I was talking about and creating an environment where young people can freely provide their expertise, we wanna make sure that we're being youth friendly. And what that means is making sure that, uh, that all of the information is accessible, approachable, and equitable. Now, keep in mind that these don't exist in vacuums. They're not separate entities and that all are check boxes that you have to meet. Uh, they do overlap and they do work together but we'll talk about them as a little separately right now. 
So when we talk about accessibility, we want to ask the question, are youth able to engage with us? Are we reducing barriers to providing feedback? Are we offering understandable language? Are we offering accommodations? These sorts of questions, right? Are they able to engage with us? With approachability, now the thing is shifting a little bit to do youth feel comfortable engaging with us? So while they may, they may be able to understand and they may be able to engage with us, do, are we creating a, a space where youth feel respected for their identities, where youth feel represented in the research or the clinical team uh, when, when there's kind of that established rapport there, uh, which is a really important thing if we want to gain valuable and authentic insight. Inequity is also an important one. So we wanna make sure that if we're going to represent youth, we are representing all groups of youth at the table. So what are we doing to support diversity and broaden our reach? Do all groups of youth have a seat at the table? Now, um, again, there are a lot of aspects of youth friendliness and our, and our team has gone into that detail with it in the past if you're looking for more info, but this is a good little snapshot of some things to keep in mind. Beautiful. So uh, this is just a little picture into how the Youth Engagement Initiative works at the Kendall Center. Um, so it's based on the McCain Center's model for youth engagement. The goal is to facilitate collaboration between youth with lived experience and other mental health and substance use stakeholders. So this is accomplished through engaging our youth engagement facilitators like myself and Jackie, who we mentioned earlier, and through engaging youth advisors in our network. So there's two groups of advisors that we connect with that uh, overlap a little bit, but are, are separate groups, our youth advisory group and our National Youth Action Council. So YAG is a small group that meets once a month and can provide feedback and consultations for projects at CAMH and within the community. So this may involve like a one-time consultation or on a research project, for example, uh, or to get feedback on how a project should be structured. NIAC is an online network of over 200 young people all across Canada. And all of these young people are coming to the table with similar lived experiences. So for teams looking to put together maybe an advisory group or recruit advisors to be a part of a project over time, then NIAC is the platform that will connect stakeholders with. Thanks, Rainier. And uh, just a brief little snapshot of the different types of youth participation that Rainier was mentioning earlier. Uh, there are kind of four different levels that we like to identify that are all varying in, in how much they're actually engaging youth. None of them are necessarily good or bad. It's just they depend on the nature of the project and uh, the resources available. So participation would involve having youth uh, actually participate in the research, maybe that's on surveys or focus groups or something like that. Consultation involves asking people for feedback as an advisor, like I mentioned with our youth advisory group. Uh, par partnership may look like bringing youth onto a project team as an equal partner, and giving them an opportunity to collaborate in, in all the kind of decision making conversations that you have. And finally, youth led participation involves having youth actually take decision-making roles like uh, like training staff or conducting research and whatnot. But that's kind of a little snapshot into what youth engagement looks like. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll toss the microphone back over to Rhaenyra. Um, thanks so much, Matt. Back to our tools under um, screening assessment and measurement. So we've talked about the videos. I wanna tell you a bit about um, this other tool we've de developed called the Quick Guide to the Revised Children's Anxiety and Depression Scale. I'm just gonna make it bigger so you can see it. Uh, we developed this because we realized um, the video probably doesn't give as much information as might be needed for someone who is looking at the RCATs for the first time. So we wanted to develop a bit more of a fulsome guide. Um, there is obviously a user manual for the RCATs, but that is quite long. We kind of wanted to make something in between. We also, um, within this quick guide, developed a chart where we uh, defined indicators for response, remission, recovery, relapse, recurrence using uh, T-score. So this didn't exist before. Um, and, and Matt, the, the point you brought up about the T-score earlier is very important. It's not just that some people might not know what a T-score is, but also do they know what to do with the information that the T-score is giving them? So um, we developed this chart with the disclaimer that it's based on research, um, hasn't necessarily been tested, and also with the disclaimer that um, it should be used in conjunction with clinical judgment. 
I want to talk, I'm just checking the time. Okay. I want to um, talk a bit about of our about our psychoeducational tools. Um, so these were developed for uh, the Caribou Integrated Care Pathway. We have a four page package, which um, gives young people uh, an overview of what depression is and also uh, talks about facts for healthy eating, um, sleep and exercise. We then took that package and um, developed two separate videos. The first one is uh, what is on depression and describes it to young people. I should mention all of these things were uh, developed mainly by young people um, in partnership with some of the experts at the Kundal Center. Um, the second video goes over tips for food, movement, and sleep. And this one is actually quite popular. I think in the past couple of years, it's been viewed 30,000 times and it's now being rolled out in uh, the curriculum across schools in, um, what is it, Florida? Can't remember which state it was, um, one of those states. Uh, Matt, you developed these videos. You are the voice of these videos. Um, I want to ask you, why do people need to watch these videos as opposed to other videos that might be out there? You know why? Because people, young people who are affected by these videos are actually involved in making these ones, right? There's so much info out there about mood, depression, eating, movement, sleep. There's a lot of info out there. It's not, the issue isn't that we're short on information. The issue is that it's hard to understand a lot of it. And especially as a young person, it, maybe the information can be a little easier to understand when it's coming from other young people. Very true. Thanks, Matt. We, um, in the treatment side of things for medication, uh, our youth team has also developed a handout on medication. It explains what SSRIs are, um, some of the benefits they might see, some tips uh, if they, uh, have any side effects. This was again developed by young people in partnership with a psychiatrist on our team and a pharmacist, uh, a really good tool. Uh, I definitely recommend downloading that one. We do have coming very soon a, a CBT manual. So this was developed for again, Darren Courtney's Caribou Integrated Care Project and um, our youth engagement team, which is uh, led by Carly Darnay and um, includes Jackie Relahan, some other youth, our associate director, uh, Dr. Stephanie Amos have all been involved in developing this new CBT manual. It's based on the um, Adolescent Coping for Depression course, but it has been updated for today's youth. So the youth team have gone through the entire manual and have updated everything so that it is more relevant to young people who you might be seeing in practice today. That is on its way. It's coming very soon. Um, kind of related, we have a package um, on, we have a cognitive restructuring worksheets that helps youth examine thoughts that they might have and that may not be helpful to them. It teaches them how to change their thoughts and consider other ways of interpreting situations, again, developed by young people and mental health professionals. Um, similarly, we've got our problem solving worksheets that uh, help you think through their problems and prompt them to describe the situation that they're in, as well as any emotions and needs that they may have. It takes them through steps that help them explore and evaluate solutions and then um, eventually develop an action plan. We have additional problem solving tools. So um, in the middle, there's an, I, I guess we would call it an info sheet that was developed by uh, Carolyn Krauss, who's a postdoctoral um, fellow at the Kundal Center. So it just describes um, some of the findings on whether problem solving training is a key ingredient in um, reducing youth depression. So it's just one page, um, describes everything. And from that, um, the, the youth team, along with Carolyn, developed a video that explains problem solving to young people and how it might be an important ingredient in help, helping them to tackle their depression. So um, that concludes the, uh, the, the tour of the tools um, that uh, Matt and I wanted to show you today. There is one um, big and exciting tool that I'm not going to talk about because we're launching it next Tuesday, um, 11 to 12 p.m. This is our online tool for the treatment of youth depression. The only thing I'll say about it is that it is, again, based on the NICE guidance. It's based on our Kundalak Kim H decision aid. So if you can make it, uh, we really encourage you to come out. We will have a panel of young people again and joining us. Um, one of our Jordan Bay primary care provider partners will be there on the panel as well. Uh, if you can make it, uh, please attend. That is it. Thank you. Um, we hope you enjoyed the tour. Uh, I know I might have been speaking pretty quickly. If there's anything I missed or if you have any questions, comments, or ideas, um, Matt and I are open and Peter's here as well. So if you have questions for Peter, um, feel free. That was a, an amazing uh, tour. I'm going to call it a tour de force of the, uh, 
of the Kundal Center's different tools. And it's just remarkable how much work uh, 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 you guys uh, have done, uh, the knowledge translation team, and, and especially with the youth. Um, um, it's so, you know, we've come a long way since the beginning of this, and you guys deserve an enormous amount of credit. So let's see if we've got questions here, or let's see, do I, do I see if anybody's raised their hand? Let's questions. I'm going to ask uh, <laughs> great comments, you guys, in the chat box. Um, what's been, I, I'll ask a question to get the discussion going, maybe. What do you think has been the biggest um, challenge and the biggest learning experience through all this since we started? Is that for me or Matt or both of us? Both of you. Um, both of us, the, the biggest, what was the question? The biggest challenge that we've experienced since the beginning? Yeah. I think um, for me, just figuring out how to do KT in this context. So I think um, knowledge brokers, uh, they don't really exist as much in specific research centers. Um, they so often just work on particular projects, but to try to figure out across an entire center how to do knowledge translation um, was challenging and not to have a guidebook on how to do that, not to have someone who's done it before, having to navigate um, this territory was uh, a challenge, an exciting challenge. And I have to say, um, I'm very grateful for the opportunities and I'm grateful for Peter for believing in KT um, if it wasn't for Peter's KT vision, we, none of us would be here in this presentation right now. We'd be at another webinar or something because um, all of these tools have been developed, as I said, with an intentional knowledge translation mandate. Thanks, Radira. Matt, what do you, what, what for you, what's been yeah. the biggest challenge? Well said, Radir. I think uh, probably the biggest challenge for me is doing my best to be representative of young people while we have these conversations. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about how uh, the youth is a really big umbrella and a lot of different groups of youth kind of fit into that category. So um, as a youth engagement facilitator, it's important for me to kind of be mindful of that and, and think of ways to engage with you from, from all sorts of groups and to do my best to make sure that everything, you know, I'm saying is, from my opinion is, is representative for everyone as well. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Very thoughtful. Marco, you have your hand up. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Peter. And um, that, that was amazing. Uh, thank you both. Really, really nice. Um, Rhaenyra, I'm not entirely sure I heard correctly the number of visualization of the tools. Would you mind just repeating the figure for me? Uh, sorry, the number of, of what? Of visualization of the tools online. The, How many times they've been visualized? Oh, um, well, I actually didn't mention that in my presentation, but we do have download numbers. I can tell you just from the past year, I think our integrated care pathway manual has been downloaded 99 times in one year. The medication handout, something like 89. Um, oh, you might've been asking about the uh, Mood Matters video. So that video has been viewed 30, over 30,000 times within a two year period. It's um, now being implemented across one of the states. I can't remember which one, I'm sorry about that in yeah. the US. And also we know that um, teachers and coaches locally are using it in their curriculum right. as well. Right. Right. So I, I was sure I heard 30,000, but it really sounded so extraordinary to me. I mean, um, I, I think this figure itself speaks very clearly of, of the success. Um, and of course, I know there's privacy. Thanks God, uh, there's privacy. But is there any imaginable mean that we can have a vague I don't know, statistic, um, you know, um, demographic, who did download these, um, these instruments, where these people were, you know, just to have a broad idea, who uh, are those who made these things so successful, um, which again, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to because of, because of, of uh, privacy, but any, any, any way you can approach that. 
Well, uh, now this is interesting. So initially when we start, so we've learned a lot about knowledge translation and about evaluation as we've, as the years have gone by um, in the Condal Center. Initially, we required people to fill out a quick um, survey before they could download the tools. But what we found, and in there we asked them, you know, who are you? Uh, where do you work? What do you intend to use the right. tool for? But what we found was this was an incredible barrier and people were not filling that survey out to download the tool. And we had to make a decision. Now, do we care more about the data or do we care more about sharing our knowledge freely and allowing people free access? So at some point we made the decision to cut that survey. Unfortunately, that also means we can't track as much as we want to, but um, you know, I figure it's better just to allow people to download no, our resources. No surprise, and I, and I totally agree. But for those limited amount of people who actually filled in the questionnaires, do, do you have data? Um, we did from years ago. I, I can't recall what the data told us, um, but I do imagine that actually I do. I can kind of recall it. I think we, it was a lot of allied help, um, social workers, nurses. We do have some uh, qualitative feedback of um, some of these allied help just saying how much they love the tools. It's a great success. Well deserved. Thank you for your answers. Thanks, Marco. Oh, and I should also mention Marco helped us with the uh, RCADS videos as well and the quick guide. So thanks to Marco for his expertise and everyone at the Kundal Center. Great. Other, other questions? Carolyn, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Hi, sorry, I'm slowly unmuting myself. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I was wondering, Rhaenyra and Matt, if you could um, maybe say something about how best to plan KT and, for example, the production of a video animation into a project and how long in advance should we start thinking about this? How, how long does it take to produce something like this? Matt, I'll let you go first if you have any thoughts. If not, I'll, I'll jump in. Sure, yeah, I was gonna say, Rhaenyra, you would be the expert on this because I, I'm very fortunate that uh, Rhaenyra took on a, the large role of, of organizing these sorts of projects and of kind of bringing us in to engage us. So Rhaenyra, I'd love to hear from you. I think Carolyn, um, and, and you know, because you have been involved in some of our video development that it depends on the project, but um, if you do plan on engaging stakeholders like young people, um, service providers, um, you do have to allow more time, definitely allow more time because uh, the process of drafting the script takes time and then you review the script with all of your team and your stakeholders and then you incorporate feedback. I mean, the storyboard, storyboard process took some time. The, um, you know, the, the rewrite took some time. Um, it does, I, I can't give you a, an exact amount of time, but just across the board, just do it earlier than you think. I would even go so far as to say right from the very beginning, you should be thinking about it, not in detail, but at least have a plan and have it worked out right at the beginning. I, I'm interested, Canada's way ahead of on this than other countries like the US and um, the UK and Europe. So we're lucky in Canada's have put so much emphasis on this in our research funding. Rosanna, you've got your hand up with a question. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, great presentation earlier and, and Matt, really uh, impressive work. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can uh, give advice on, for, for teams that want to um, do the kind of engagement of stakeholders that you've done, like what would be your advice on how to get started? you know, in terms of like developing resources that are um, reviewed by stakeholders, that kind of thing. Matt, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I might, I might say just from speaking from a youth perspective, it's important to have youth involved in the project uh, early on, um, I think in an, in an authentic way. That way it doesn't seem like so much of an afterthought or a tokenistic kind of way of engaging with youth. Um, I think if you can bring youth actually onto the research team, uh, not as like some, some lamb on a, on a pedestal, like the youth on the team, like actually a part of the research team, then that representation is kind of brought in and then hopefully the engagement kind of naturally follows. And I, I think Rosanna, it's, 
sometimes um, we think we don't know how to navigate. We think we're going to um, have someone tell us what to do. But I find as a knowledge broker, it is up to you. Like there's no one there to tell you what you need to do and when. It's up to you to sort of reach out to the stakeholders that you think you might want to engage, make sure they're available, start setting up the meetings, um, debrief them. It's uh, really about your own you know, preference in that process. But one thing I've learned is I think when I started, when I was, you know, very new to the center, I thought, oh, someone was going to help me and tell me what I needed to do to figure things out, but um, then realized, well, I need to figure out, um, you know, with Matt, with our primary care providers, I, I'm the one who needs to talk to them and, and figure out how best to work with them and how they want to be consulted. Great. Thank you. Any any other questions? Anybody else want to raise their hand? I just saw your comment, Matt. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we love working with you and, and the rest of the team. I think it, it's worth acknowledging um, Joanna Henderson right with Ed Nyack and and Gloria Heim who worked uh, so closely with Joanna uh, with Nyack getting that set up so they were really the pioneers in Canada around youth engagement in research uh, activities so um, uh, that was really quite something well if there are no further questions um, I want to say a huge thank you to Matt and Renera for uh, a fantastic fascinating whirlwind tour of the Kundal toolbox. Please complete the evaluation survey, everyone. We really do use these um, to think about future presentations. Uh, scan the QR code, click on the link in the chat box. The link will be emailed to you um, later today. And please uh, pay attention to other speakers in the McCain series and in the Kundal series that will be coming up. We've got some great speakers lined up for the year. So I look forward to uh, seeing you all later at one of the other presentations. Thanks again to Matt and Renera. Bye-bye.